The beginning of part two, the sacrament. Chapter one, the dimension of covenant and of grace. Section one, Ephesians chapter five, verses 21 to 33. Segment A, introduction and connection. The text of Ephesians five, verse 21 to 33. General audience number 87 of July 28th, 1982. Today we begin a new chapter on the subject of marriage by reading Paul's words to the Ephesians. Quote, Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, he who is the Savior of his body. And as the church is subject to Christ so also wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. And you, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water accompanied by the word so as to present his church before himself all glorious, without spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind, but holy and immaculate. In the same way, husbands have the duty to love their wives as their own body. For the one who loves his wife loves himself. No one, in fact, ever hates his own flesh, but he nourishes and cares for it, as Christ does with the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and unite with his wife, and the two will form one flesh. This mystery is great. I say this with reference to Christ and the church. Therefore, also you, each one on his part, should love his wife as himself, and the woman should have reverence toward her husband. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 33, and Christ's words. We should now subject the quoted text contained in Ephesians 5 to a thorough and deep analysis. Just as earlier we analyzed the different words of Christ that seem to have a key significance for the theology of the body. We treated the words in which Christ appeals to the beginning, Matthew chapter 19 verse 4 and Mark chapter 10 verse 6, to the human heart in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 verse 28, and to the future resurrection, Matthew chapter 22 verse 30, Mark 12, 25, and Luke 20 verses 35 and 36. What is contained in the passage of Ephesians is the crowning, as it were, of these other comprehensive key words. Since the theology of the body emerged from them in its evangelical outline, simple and at the same time fundamental, we must in some sense presuppose this theology in interpreting the passage from Ephesians just quoted. Therefore, if one wishes to interpret this passage, one must do so in the light of what Christ has told us about the human body. By his words, he not only appealed to historical man, to his heart, and by this very fact to the man of concupiscence, who is always contemporary, but he also highlighted, on the one hand, the perspective of the beginning, or of original innocence and justice, and on the other hand, the eschatological perspective of the resurrection of the body, when, quote, they will take neither wife nor husband, Luke chapter 20, verse 35. All of this is part of the theological perspective of the redemption of the body, Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Ephesians 5, 21 to 33. Two meanings of body. The words of the author of Ephesians 2 are centered on the body, both in its metaphorical meaning, that is, on the body of Christ, which is the church, and in its concrete meaning, that is, on the human body, in its perennial masculinity and femininity, in its perennial destiny for union in marriage. As Genesis says, quote, For this reason a man will leave his father and his mother and unite with his wife, and the two will be one flesh. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. In what way do these two meanings of the term body appear and converge in the passage from Ephesians? And why do they appear and converge there? We must ask ourselves these questions, expecting not so much immediate and direct answers, but possibly deep, thought-through, and long-term answers that our earlier analyses have prepared us for. In fact, that passage from Ephesians 
cannot be correctly understood except in the broad biblical context, considering it as the crowning of the themes and truths that ebb and flow like long waves through the word of God revealed in sacred scripture. They are central themes and essential truths. And for this reason, the text quoted from Ephesians is also a key text and classical. Does Ephesians 5, verse 21 to 33, speak about the sacramentality of marriage? It is a well-known text in the liturgy, where it always appears in the context of the sacrament of marriage. The church, lex orandi, rule of prayer, sees in it an explicit reference to this sacrament, and the lex orandi presupposes, and at the same time expresses, the lex credendi, the rule of faith. If we grant this premise, we must immediately ask ourselves, in this classical text of Ephesians, how does the truth about the sacramentality of marriage come to light? In what way is it expressed or confirmed in that text? It will become clear that the answer to these questions cannot be immediate and direct, but gradual and long-term. This is already confirmed by a first glance at this text, which brings us back to Genesis, and thus to the beginning, and which takes up again and well-known analogy of spousal love between God and his chosen people. From the writings of the prophets, the prophets of the Old Testament in its description of the relationship between Christ and the church, without examining these relationships, it would be difficult to answer the question about the manner in which Ephesians treats the sacramentality of marriage. We will also see how the answer we are seeking must pass through the whole area of problems analyzed earlier, that is, through the theology of the body. Sacrament and body. The sacrament, or sacramentality, in the most general sense of this term, intersects with the body and presupposes the theology of the body. According to the generally recognized meaning, the sacrament is, in fact, a visible sign. Body also refers to what is visible. It signifies the visibility of the world and of man. In some way, therefore, even if in the most general way, the body enters into the definition of sacrament, which is a visible sign of an invisible reality, namely of the spiritual, transcendent, and divine reality. In this sign, and through this sign, God gives himself to man in his transcendent truth and in his love. The sacrament is a sign of grace, and it is an efficacious sign. It does not merely indicate and express grace in a visible way in the manner of a sign, but produces grace and contributes efficaciously to cause that grace to become part of man and to realize and fulfill the work of salvation in him. The work determined ahead of time by God from eternity and fully revealed in Christ. Direction of the following analyses. I would say that this first glance at the classical text of Ephesians already indicates the direction in which we must develop our further analyses. These analyses must begin with the preliminary understanding of the text in itself. They must then lead us, so to speak, beyond the limits of the text in order that we may understand, if possible, to the very depths what wealth of truth revealed by God is contained within the scope of that stupendous page. Using the well-known expression of the Constitution Gaudium et Spes, one can say that the passage we chose from Ephesians, quote, reveals in a particular way man to man himself and makes his supreme vocation clear. Gaudium et Spes 22.1 Inasmuch as he participates in the experience of the incarnate person. In fact, when he created him in his image, God created him from the beginning as male and female. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. During the following analyses, we will try, above all in the light of the text quoted from Ephesians, to understand the sacrament more deeply, in particular marriage as a sacrament. First in the dimension of the covenant and of grace, and then in the dimension of the sacramental sign.